Okay, it says we are recording. It'll probably ask you to accept that too. My name is Dave Myers. I'm with the University of Maryland Extension. Uh, I'm going to spend tonight with the private pesticide applicator recertification with you tonight. And I'm going to look at the technical sciences of agriculture as we kind of journey through our two hours worth of uh, recertification tonight. And uh, again, um, I'm County Extension agent in Arundel County. And uh, so I guess I'll share with some things with you um, that might be of interest, I hope. And uh, Biochemistry at work. Uh, basically, when we think about uh, not just pesticides, but the real science of agriculture, it's all biochemistry. Um, every living thing, right? Carbon-based life forms require biochemistry approaches. And so I, I lump pesticides into that um, a biochemical uh, a process. Before we get started tonight, this is probably the most important thing you have to do, and that's fill out this attendance form. And so give me a check mark if everyone's got that uh, in their hands. Best if you have it now. If you don't, you're going to want to keep that, take all the information necessary to fill it out because you really haven't done your uh, two hours until this gets filled out, sent to me. And I'll sign off on it, and send it over to MDA because Maryland Department of Agriculture, they're the regulatory agency, they're the ones that keep you uh, your records for your certification. It's not Extension that does that. Extension does the teaching. That's what I'm here for tonight. And so I'll forward this information over to Maryland Department of Agriculture. That'll give you your two year, two hours, four credits, uh, two hours of training. And so there's the meeting number. It's administered online through the Arundel County Extension Office. And uh, um, there's the date. And you need to put in your certificate number, last four digits of your social security number, your name, um, and then print uh, or company, put your farm or company name then that. And, uh, and we'll have some verification words as we go through about every 30 minutes tonight. I'll give a course word to remember, and I'll try to write them down myself. And um, that just helps verify that you participated. So you need to put those. It might be a phrase or a word that we choose for those verification words. And then print your name, sign it. I'll sign off on it and send it over to MDA. Any questions about that? And that's how we get the uh, verified attendance. And so I think it's pretty straightforward. So you can send that to me any way you want to. I prefer if you email it, um, but you can fax it and uh, and uh, or snail mail it or however you want to get it to me is fine. Uh, just give me a copy. And uh, the uh, you know as I think through extension, you know, working with the University of Maryland as a faculty member in extension, um, and not just uh, here in the, you know, in Anne Arundel County, but around the state and around the country and even around internationally. I, I think that uh, my slogan is, as an extension agent is every farmer a better farmer. And myself as a farmer, I know that's true. Every farmer has become a better farmer over the years. I can go back six generations of Myers, that uh, grand, great grandfathers that farmed in the Valley of Virginia. And uh, I know everyone, I would say they, they probably got better during their lifetime, uh, had some kind of new technology that uh, evolved during every one of our lifetimes. And I'll tell you, it's been a pretty fantastic journey uh, since I began with my grandfather. So we've changed a lot. Agriculture's changed a lot, but a lot more pressure to produce more um, is making that a requ requirement. It's not just a, a noble notion that every farmer is a better farmer, but it's really a requirement. And that's because there's really few of, fewer of us doing it too. Um, maybe, maybe not so much around the world, but in the U.S., it's much. It's only down to one percent or less of the population now that actually sits in the tractor seat. So there's a lot to be said about the farmers of the U.S. and uh, what they have done with science and technology. And uh, you know, I, I, I'm not. I'm not at all um, worried about population when it comes to the potential for agriculture to feed them. The um, 14 billion um, is. Uh, um, some think, uh, you know, a lot. We're worried about almost, well, we're over eight bit. We've just turned over eight billion here just this last year. And uh, I really think with the land that we have now, uh, we could easily feed 14 billion um, just by the land that's in production. If we increase the science um, uh, to the level that we have currently, we could easily feed 14 billion. And I'm not too concerned that we couldn't feed 28 billion with just the land we have in production. Um, so again, it's not an issue of agricultural production, I think, uh, as much as it is politics and other issues around the world that might uh, get in the way of the science of agriculture. So I think farmers have gotten better, they'll get better, and they'll continue to get better as we go forward in the population. Well, I really do believe that the population is finally starting to show a little bit of a slowdown. 
And that's a good thing. We reached our first billion in 1804, uh, the second billion in 1927. And that's after historically, um, we really started this uptick around this, maybe some might say around the 1500s, we started kind of a, a slow uh, but gradual increase in the world population. And uh, it's interesting for the previous 10,000 years of recorded history, uh, written and recorded history, if we look at the population of the world population of, of humans, uh, we oscillated between 300 and 500 million. So we, knew, we were always kind of a third of a billion to half a billion and kind of a, a real gentle oscillation. And it was probably due to, you know, disease and war and famine and all the things that we face today without the science and technology, right? And so really it's this industrial revolution and then the boom in science that ultimately allows us to this continue this population growth. And by 1927, it took 123 years to go from 1 billion to 2 billion. Then in 1960, we reached our third billion. That took 33 years. And after that, we put on a billion people in less than 15 years. Um, every 15 years, we've added another billion. What we're finally starting to see, maybe the evidence of a bell curve. Um, and we anticipate that, um, that we'll probably start to see, uh, so at some point, the flattening or a bell curve of population, I'm going to predict somewhere between 14 and maybe 20 B. So we still could feed them. I'm not too concerned about that. We might have other problems, but we certainly could uh, produce, them, produce it and feed it. So it, it's science and technology that's allowed us to do that and all the advances uh, that have gone along with that. So I'm con I believe that um, this came out from CAST. CAST is the Council for Agricultural Science and Technology. And it came out with a prediction in 2015 about this new generation of agriculturalists. Uh, they called it Gen Ag. And I, I really do like that concept. I think with science and technology, um, we will meet the, the needs of feeding the globe, global population. And maybe now better than ever. You know, pre-COVID, uh, around, that, around that 215 to 217 period, we actually we were feeding the world better than any time in the history of mankind. That means there was less percentage of starving. That doesn't mean the starving and, and uh, malnutrition was not still a worldwide problem, but it was the least it had ever been in the history of humans. And I think that's pretty amazing too. I think when you can attribute that to the amazing advances in, in the science of agriculture. So it doesn't surprise me that they're predicting this new generation as kind of a revolution of agriculture coming, coming forward. And um, the uh, opportunities for a lot of employment too in this field of agriculture very high tech agriculture still is, is something that uh, we have, I think, great opportunities for people. The, um, but gener generation agriculture, gen ag, I think is gonna be some, some type, probably within the next 40, 50 years, gonna be revolutionary, even what we think about agriculture today. I took this picture when I was in Rwanda, land of a thousand hills. And what amazed me about this was that that's a population of agrarian population. We're about, 80% of the able-bodied people, or 80% of the population, which are the able-bodied people, they're either old enough or not too old uh, to handle that tillage hoe there. All that land is all, it's a land of a thousand hills in Rwanda, very small country, but it's agriculture from top to bottom. And that's coffee you see right in the foreground there. And they did all that terracing by hand. That's not mechanization. That's all hand labor, which is really incredible when you think about it. Um, down in the valley there, you can see there's, a little bit of mechanized farming down in those valleys, but on those hills, that's all um, done with a hill, tillage hoe and, and hard and, and muscle and back. And here's an example of a manoring up on those terraces. I took a picture of that in Rwanda, and uh, there's some women and men actually manuring bananas and cassava and coffee and napier grass for their goats and cattle. And so hard work, agrarian country. I don't know that our U.S. citizens will ever come back, go back to that, where 80 percent of them do that kind of work. But I was there because they were so um, uh, successful um, as an agrarian society that they wanted to learn how to do more export production. And so I thought that was pretty amazing, too. Um, so agrarian will work if the people uh, can endure it. I don't think Americans do that. They're there. I actually witnessed them building terraces by hand. It's a community, kind of a community sport, I guess you'd say, in Rwanda. And everyone comes out. And I was just amazed at how well they built those terraces by hand and how well they took care of that soil on the hillside on some of those slopes. Pretty amazing. 
We started this year a summary of um, so uh, of we had our first mushroom grower symposium. So I want to share that with you too. I thought that was pretty interesting. Typically, we have we don't really have uh, like Penn, Penn State, which I guess you'd say is the uh, mushroom capital of the country as far as production. Um, Penn State has uh, this uh, amazing program in mushroom science, and uh, uh, but we're we've got uh, I thought at our symposium about thirty eight growers came out uh, this winter uh, here in Maryland, and I was pretty amazed at all the specialty mushrooms that uh, they were into. And uh, so I got Bar John uh, Pecci. He's he's the uh, uh, up at the Department of Plant Pathology and Environmental Microbiology at Penn State, and he had, runs the Specialty Mushroom Production Laboratory. And so I'll I'll start, I want to show you his slides because I think they're kind of interesting. Uh, he looked talking about, and this is at the Mushroom Research Center in Penn State, so the MRC, and uh, he shared with us some really nice slides about that. So I thought it'd be interesting to see. Of course, making the um, the substrate for mushroom production really uh, requires uh, complete um, sterilization of the media so that you're not bringing any other pathogens um, or fungi or bacteria in, in with the, the um, substrate. And so they typically have a blender and a homogenizer and a steamer and all that kind of thing to get to a very controlled product. Um, and then they had 19 climate controlled growing rooms uh, growing a number of different mushrooms, especially mushrooms. So. Fantastic work. Of course, here's the backbone. This is the backbone of the Pennsylvania mushroom industry, which I think they produce like 80% of the mushrooms we eat in the U.S. Agaricus spores, which are the button mushrooms or the tiny baby portobellas, which we think of, you could think of in most of our chilies and things like that. And uh, But there's a lot of other ones that are really interesting. This one here is lion's manes, which is actually native to America and Europe and Asia. And, uh, you know, all these mushrooms have a lot of different health benefits, and so they're touted for that. And uh, and so we looked at some, how could we culture some of these things? Um, this lion's mane uh, is cultivated on a sawdust bag media, 37 to 46 day cropping cycle. Typically, there's two flushes, so two harvests. And uh, so they can be quite, uh, but you can also do the, what they call the totem method. Now, for mushroom production, you can't use diseased logs. You have to use very fr fresh and cut and healthy logs. And they do things like the totem method, which is kind of interesting. I'll show you an example of that. But they typically fresh cut logs, 9 to 14 inches in diameter, 12 inches long. And then they put in the spore and substrate between each of the stacked logs, typically beech, oak, and sugar maple. And they cover it with paper bags for the first year. And so here's kind of an example of putting the spore and media in there and then and then covering it with paper deck bags. And they put an area in the woods typically where they can sprinkle irrigate it when it needs to uh, from time to time. But a lot of times just natural rainfall um, is all they need. And so here's kind of a setup here of some of these specialty mu uh, mushrooms using the totem method. Here's an example again of using a different substrate um, to go ahead and inoculate these logs and stack them. And then bag them. Pretty, pretty interesting, I think. Uh, so if you're interested in especially mushrooms, that's kind of a uh, interesting thing. They also, also logs. We'll show a picture here of shiitakes on on log um, um, log inoculated logs. Here's one called wine caps tropharia, um, and it's native to eastern U.S. So we typically have that in this area in our woods. It's got its name because of that nice wine cap color. One thing nice about this one is it actually can be cultivated in the garden. So um, really interesting. They can also be done in bag. Here's a wine cap called King Strafaria, King Strafaria. And they're four to eight weeks. Um, they typically use a substrate of straw and wood chips. And then, um, of course, they put in the spore and, and then get the right percentage of moisture. It's an outdoor bed system, also an indoor substrate. So these wine caps are pretty um Pretty important, especially mushrooms. Um, New York City uh, has a really amazing mushroom program. Uh, Yolanda Gonzalez came down also and joined the group there here in Maryland and uh, showed us some really amazing things. The Mushroom Queens up in Queens uh, in New York City, uh, making especially mushrooms right there in warehouses uh, for the high-end restaurants. And, and so I thought that was pretty amazing. And then the wine caps, a lot of the garden gardeners and even small farmers, urban farmers and small farmers were using wine cap mushrooms in their bedding materials where they would use a layer of, typically you start with a layer of cardboard, then wood chips, 
then sawdust with the spawn and wood chips, and then I cover it off with the sawdust and spawn and straw. And then they would grow those beautiful wine caps. Um, and they could put that right around the and use that basically as a wheat control too um, for their vegetable production. So that's kind of an interesting uh, approach to weed control as well as having uh, double cropping, if you will. In this case, it's onions but, um, or garlic with um, the wine cap mushrooms growing. And the garlic would be down and, um, below that salt, that stacked layer of, um, of spawn and sawdust and uh, cardboard. And so that's kind of neat. Uh, it's something that can be grown uh, right into some people will actually put them in high tunnels too and, and really get into production. So they're pretty unique, all these different mushrooms. Here's the oyster mushroom. Uh, typically on dead hardwoods, of course, they have to be fresh cut. Um, they can grow easily also in substrates, and they use different um, substrate medias. Uh, some people use uh, straw, uh, waste hulls uh, from like rice hulls and, and toilet paper rolls, even rolls of toilet paper can uh, be inoculated. And so commercial production of, of these uh, would be more of a, a, a recipe, if you will, of chopped straw cottonseed hull, supplemental protein, gypsum, and limestone. Of course, they'd be inoculated, um, 75 to 25 cottonseed hulls to wheat straw, 65% moisture, spawn rate of 2 to 5% wet wheat. So again, and then these they basically put holes in these bags and out pops those oyster-type mushrooms. It's a very much well, great. So here's a picture, day 19, day 20, and day 21, and there's day 22, the oyster mushroom. They yield quite well. Um, first cut, you can harvest them three times. Typically, you get three pounds the first harvest. Let them go another month, get another cutting, another harvest, and then a third harvest. And so up to five pounds of harvested mushrooms off a 19-pound bag, bag of substrate and spawn. The king oysters, also very productive in bag culture. And then, of course, shiitake. Um, a lot of people do those outdoor, but some do bag culture shiitake now. And if you're interested in mushrooms, probably the two best books uh, on shiitake, one comes out of Penn State and the other one, even the Penn State fellows would, would yield to the, the book from Cornell as being probably the best book on log-based shiitake cultivation. So, so anyway, it's kind of a, uh, of course, most shiitake that we think of in this area probably are done on logs, but uh, natural log, but that's considered more uh, diversified farming and hobbyists, the real larger scale production now of shiitake is on the commercial bag production. So they call them synthetic logs. It's a recipe made by um, Penn State. And well, Cornell might have been big in that too. I will give Penn State all the credit. The sawdust primarily uh, plus starch sources, wheat bran, rice bran, millet, rye, maize. And they add uh, table glucose, um, table sugar, gypsum, and limestone for the substrate of these synthetic shiitake logs. And they have kind of a recipe there for it. All of them around that 60, 65% moisture from, seems like to be the range for most mushroom production. And so the shiitake synthetic log has higher yields uh, in a shorter production period of eight weeks and then two to three weeks between flushes. So they're very productive and they're very quick. Whereas the log system, uh, yields um, yields less, but they yield over a much longer period of time, but they tend to take a year to, for, for that first, or even more for that first flush. And then four to six years of total production. So some people like the natural logs for that long production cycle. Uh, problem with the logs are typically you're more prone to pests, slugs, beetles, squirrel, probably need some kind of pest management more so um, from a standpoint of pesticide approaches from the natural log approach. Some say the shiitake on the natural log tastes better, have maybe a little bit better quality. They're higher in value um, and have less capital investment. So that'd be a reason why. And again, Cornell says the best uh, shiitake in the, uh, are on oak, either red or white oak and sugar maple. And then very good on American hornbeam, musclewood and beech. And good on birch, hickory and maple and not suitable on any of the softwoods or evergreens. And then inoculating, typically you drill and put a plug in the spawn plugs. So it's pretty easy and you can buy those online. And uh, then you stack your logs and you wait till the mycelium shows on from both ends of the logs and then you soak them to bring them into production or what they call forcing the flush. So anyway, especially mushrooms, pretty cool. A lot of information. So I thought I'd share that because we had a pretty successful meet and a lot of interest. And so I thought maybe you might enjoy that.
So I'm, I saw an email, uh, Buzz asked what my email address is. So on the, um, I'll put it out. I'll give it to you later before we, before we end. Just don't let me forget. And let's see. We're about 30 minutes into it. And uh, I think our first, um, let's do our first uh, code word. So our first uh, verification course word. Uh, let's go ahead and put um, shiitake. S-H-I-T-A-K. Is that an E or I at the end? I have to go back and look. That's terrible. I don't know how to spell it. Ah, two eyes. I knew I had it wrong. Two eyes. S-H-I-I-T-A-K-E. I knew something didn't look right. So that's our first course words. Everyone got that? I'm gonna go ahead and put it down here in the uh, in the chat. So our first course word. Huh. Backspace here. Let me see. S H I I T A K E. Enter shiitake. That'll be our first uh, course word. Give me a check mark if you got that. Might want to clear your checks first and give me a check mark. <laughs> Anyway, I look for those check marks. Everyone got that? Okay. All right. Clear your check marks. And let's go ahead and go get on here. Let's I want to just want to share that with you also. I've started at um, my website, um, at my actually my extension office. I started a new project I want to make you aware of, um, and it's uh, it's actually at the Naval Academy Dairy Farm property. Uh, so kind of dear to me, having worked there for eighteen years and now with extension twenty five years. My back, we're back at home in the on that Navy property, dairy property, and um, the Anne Arundel UFRC, Urban Farming Research Clinic. I kind of decided to go uh, and spend some time promoting more urban farming opportunities. And I, I always say gardening is one thing. Gardening's fun and gardening is enjoyable, but farming means you're in it for profit. And so that's what I'm hoping to do with the Urban Farming Center is to show people how in small scale operation can be extremely profitable. I think a lot of us know that already, um, but I don't think the general public appreciates that that gardening and farming are two different things. They both can be enjoyable, but farming is done for profit. And at the, at the website there, you see that I have um, developed a nutrient management plan. So if you want to see the nutrient management plan for the urban farm and my soil test and follow the progress. And so I thought maybe I'd just share some of the progress. We started last year, 2022. We had an old field that kind of had been left abandoned for quite some time and went out there and basically decided I'm not too keen on mold boarding, but uh, decided that was the best way forward on this piece of property. So we went ahead and clean tailed it and got it ready. And um, and so there we are in May, finally got the slate cleared, looking pretty good. And here I'm out there and, I, and because I'm into urban farming, I'm going to use fertilizers and I'm going to use, I'm a weed scientist, so I'm not going to get out there with a hoe anymore and I have to, I'm going to use herbicides. And so that's why I say it's more of a farming venture on small scale, because we're going to use all the uh, all the biochemical approaches and all the science that's involved in agriculture. And so we went right out there and we planted pumpkins and Indian corn, popcorn, sunflowers, and uh, put a little herbicides out there and certainly put some fertilizer on there and uh, according to the soil test and, and nutrient management plan and got off to a really nice start. I had an intern there. We are after we uh, did a little spraying in the pumpkins, getting them going. And there we are uh, doing a little extra hoe. And that doesn't mean you don't have to still, still do hoeing. And it's still occasionally required for some of those escapes. There's my uh, going back out with some sandia and, of course, killing some of that morning glory and nut, nut sedge a little bit, giving it a little bit tougher time so the pumpkins have a little better chance. And uh, by July 5th, you know, we starting to have a pretty good little farm there. And we had a little millet in some of the areas and in the background there's some sunflowers and corn. And here's a picture of me standing between the uh, couple rows of sunflowers, the pumpkins and the Indian corn about the mid, towards the end of July there. So the urban farm popped the life pretty good. And by August, we had uh, a beautiful example of what uh, small-scale agriculture can actually do. 
And we didn't use too many fungicides. We used everything kind of IPM approach, right? Going out there, doing the best we can. We had a fall harvest party, had a lot of fun. And I think it just shows you, uh, you know, uh, how small scale agriculture really has good meaning and, and really good impacts in your area. Of course, that's the area in the fall. After the harvest there, going ahead and hit the disc on there a little bit, put some rye in there. And then I started in November, putting up a high tunnel. And this year, got um, I've got a lot going on. In fact, I planted the vineyard there today and uh, and hopefully have a chili project in there like this one I had in the past. So we're going to have a chili mix, going to use do hot peppers and things. But here's what I got planned for this year. In fact, I already got the peaches, apples, blackberries back here in the row planted. We've planted the vineyard today, going to have a little hops yard. Got the uh, high tunnel with pump, with um, peppers, hot pepper trial. Going to put a little asparagus bed, cut flowers, pumpkins. That little eight, acre and a half, two acres is going to be pretty amazing little uh, high-end uh, production area uh, in short order. And we use it as a teaching tool. That's the whole reason I'm doing it. Now, we know that, um, you know, when I think about, I teach a course at Maryland, University of Maryland, pesticide use and safety course. And I've got 20 students right now. That I've done it now. I'll try and think. I think I've done it. This will be 36 semesters straight that I have taught this course at Maryland. And it's interesting to watch uh, people, uh, you know, young students coming in, uh, not understanding or appreciating the science that's necessary for agriculture, um, trying to tell them, teach them that pesticides are certainly a very important tool in production agriculture and trying to get them to realize it's biochemistry. And the contributions of pesticides, I love this paper by CAST. I'm a member of CAST, the Council for Agri Agricultural Science and Technology. They write issue papers that they help educate our legislators. So there's a DC think tank organization made up of many universities and a lot of the ag companies. And anyway, this paper here uh, written uh, in 2014, issue paper number 55. And you can, you can get these papers online. Just go to CAST, C-A-S-T. You'll be able to read these and see these online. But this one called The Contributions of Pesticides to Pest Management and Meeting the Global Need for Food Production by 2050 is really an amazing uh, account uh, of what pesticides have done and will continue to do going forward uh, to meet those demands for food production. So again, it's all about um, having that production goal, meeting those production goals to feed this population worldwide. And it's also about the, the demand that we have for high quality food. And then of course, having all this high quality food, uh, improved health. Uh, you know, I can remember it wasn't, it seemed like, you know, you know, as I, uh, you know, I think back when I was a kid, you only had some things were only seasonal, you know, we'd only had strawberries in the spring of the year, maybe, you know, we had all, we had seasonal things, right. But now everything is, there's no seasons anymore. We could have high quality fruit, fruits and vegetables all year long. And they're so affordable that I've come to the conclusion that they're too affordable because 46% of what's harvested in the U.S. Uh, in the ways of fruits and vegetables um, and even agronomic crops lands up in the landfill, ends up in the landfill before it's even eaten. And that's pretty, that's a, that, that to me, that's an interrogation on us, right? I mean, that's, that's like, holy cow, are we that wasteful, that unconscious about uh, what uh, the value of that crop is. And, um, and even 26% of what we put in the refrigerator uh, will end up in the trash can without being eaten. So it's, it's pretty shameful, isn't it? And, uh, and it, it's because it's so affordable. Uh, we have, in the history of civilizations, um, we have probably the lowest food bill of any. And that includes any European country or any other country. We're down around that 9 to 10% level to most often. COVID probably took it up to around 12. We get uncomfortable about 13%. That's happened a few times during some depressions and things. And, and um, But uh, most of the time, we, we're paying around 9 to 10% of our income to feeding ourselves. Uh, that's, that's not unlike the world. I mean, that's certainly different. The world's a different place when it comes to that. Even the Europeans will spend 16% or more of their dollar into feeding themselves. So again, we've got it made here. And maybe when you read a paper like this, Food Loss and Waste, you realize that, you know, hey, we got to treat food with a little more respect than that. And we got to teach maybe our the next generation to have a little more respect to that. And it might be that uh, we end up paying a lot more in the future than we're paying now for food. I'd like to think of pesticides as plant medicines. Wouldn't it be nice if we could kind of think that way? 
you know, why is it so different that we can have a pharmaceutical um, or a veterinarian care product? And we consider that medicine, but uh, plants, on the other hand, which are very valuable, somehow um, that's a pesticide. We need to change our perspective, I think. We need to help people understand, too, that uh, we have to protect those plants. Plant Crop plant protection products is what I typically like to think of as pesticides. And they certainly are, can be used prescriptively, just like we use pharmaceuticals. In fact, admire that same admire that we put on our dog and cats, that is a veterinarian um, medicine to, for flea and ticks, which is imidacloprid, that same product. Uh, we also put pour on our cattle for fly and tick control. We also put it on our tomatoes and most of our vegetable crops, right? This is a very good systemic neonicotinoid insecticide. And so again, and we also may spray it in our home if we had a problem with bed bugs or some other kind of outbreak. So we use these products, um, these biochemical products in a lot of different ways. And sometimes we don't even connect the dots very well. And so again, it's very critical, I think, to give a fuller appreciation. And you know, I always ask this question, you know, do we need pesticides? And uh, you guys are getting recertified tonight. Uh, you probably could answer this question pretty well. And uh, But what about the rest of the world? And what about our average citizens that are disconnected from agriculture right now. I think they've got to come to this conclusion that no, we don't, we want everything organic. But even organic production uh, has pesticides, right? They use, in fact, they use very similar, typically active ingredients uh, in their pesticides. And so they just derive them naturally. In fact, most pesticides that we have synthetically produced, we learned how, we learned how to produce them by looking at the natural world and the biochemicals that were already there. And so it all relates back to natural science and understanding the natural world. But um, well, I guess my question is to you is what percent do you think currently um, of the U.S. product, U.S. agricultural product, what percent do you think is produced under the USDA Organic Certif Certified Certification Program? Uh, and so well, go ahead and throw it in the chat and guess what you think that is. What percent of the USDA product? And how would you know? Where would you go to find that? And so a lot of people, they make a lot of claims about that. But uh, the best way I could tell you to do it would be go to the USDA Economic Research Service and pull down the latest uh, organic uh, production reports. And they're the ones, they're the ones that keep track of this certification through USDA Nat National, uh, National Agricultural Statistics Service. That's the best report. So what percent do you think are or is organic in the U.S.? And um, yeah, I see a couple of questions there, uh, but it's 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 about five percent, or, or we're just right. In fact, we haven't gone over five percent yet, and so at least not since the last report. The last report that came out was two thousand. Um, well, we're waiting on a report uh, right now, but the last reports I could find were two thousand thirteen. These are most updated reports you'll find that have been printed, published, and so we, um, in fact. Um, Interesting thing about that is, and, and then you can look at the different sectors as you dive down into this report. You can see that it's kind of fun to look down through there and you can see that grapes is at 3.9%. What's really interesting, the highest crop uh, that's organic is carrots is at 14.36%. But then if you look at something like corn, 0.26%. Or um, if you look even uh, look at something, you don't see the livestock on there, but chickens is like 0.0%. Three seven percent, some really low number. So we're really, uh, for the most, the vast majority, it, it works out to around four to five percent of our product. So not about ninety six percent of the U.S. product is still produced uh, with conventional methods, with fertilizers and pesticides that our conventional farmers and the biotechnology that our current our farmers are using. And then someone asked, well, with all this demand for organic production. Why aren't we? Uh, why aren't we increasing? In fact, Rodell predicted in 2003, by that year 2013, they predicted out to 2013 and said that uh, we would be surpassed five percent. They were at three percent 2003, but we got close to five percent around 2008. Didn't quite make it. We had a recession and we never came back. Really, we're starting to see a little uptick now. But we're still still struggling to bring all, the, all these farmers into organic production. You know? I see, hey, it's got to be economically viable, right? Um, you know, maybe it's viable for small scale agriculture. Maybe our smaller farmers should do organic production, but maybe it's not that viable for our large acreages in production, um, especially when we have such very high demands on ex 
these hopper yields that we uh, are sh shooting for. And there's a lot of times there's just not enough organic matter to spread around. So fertilizer and nutrient management becomes a big issue. Probably the main, probably the main reason that we were able to escalate to the yields that we have now was this process called the Haber-Bosch process. Anyone know what that is? The Haber-Bosch process? 78% of the air that we breathe is N2. Now, N2 is an inert gas. Nitrogen is an inert gas as N2. But 78% of every breath we take is N2 gas. Plants or any of us are, are completely, basically completely inert right? Just comes in and out of our lungs. Plants can't do anything with it until it becomes a nitrate. Uh, um, and so again, we can do that through nitrogen fixation with legumes, or we can do that through the Haber-Bosch process, a lot of energy and natural gas uh, to basically under, uh, to convert that N2, atmospheric N2 to nitrate. And so that's a very important process. And without that process, we would probably not exceeded 3 billion people in the world. So we can thank science in a lot of ways to where we're at and how we got there. The, um, so again, conventional pesticides, that's probably what we typically think of when we think of it in agriculture. Um, but yeah, we use a lot of other pesticides too. The non-conventional pesticides would be chlorine, hypochlorites, all of our drinking water, all of our um, sanitation of all our hospitals and all of our eating surfaces and cleansing our fruits and vegetables, and then especially biocides and wood preservatives. And then the group that we typically think of in production agriculture would be this group of conventional pesticides and then other pesticides, about 24, 25%, a quarter of it, what we might think of as traditional pesticides, fungicides, insecticides, herbicides, rodenticides. And then the uh, and so we can see where we use about 46% of the pesticides that we use in the U.S. are herbicides. And then we, that shouldn't surprise us, I don't think. Um, you know, so again, we, we rely on that. That's the reason why we're not out there cultivating. It's also a reason why about 30% of us aren't farming uh, because of herbicides, because we'd have to be out there cultivating and, uh, and tilling and hoeing. And so we'd be more like Rwandans pretty quick, even with all, even with the, uh, the machinery would still have a quite more of us engaged in farming if we didn't have herbicides. And of course, insecticides and fungicides are crop protection. And, uh, and so again, uh, it's a big, it's a, it's a, comes up to a, a quite a bit of product here in the U.S., about 1.2 billion pounds. Typically now we've been, this is 2001, typically we've been down below 1 billion, 1 billion pounds. So somewhere around that 950 million pounds of product being used in the U.S., and that other category includes uh, rodenticides, molluscicides, um, some of your insect repellents, some of your um, inorganic compounds like sulfur and things like that, and zinc sulfate mothballs. So a lot of miscellaneous things fall in that and fumigants and nematicides. If we look at the world's market of pesticides, uh, we, we, we have about 20% uh, of it um, as far as pounds of product in the U.S. Um, so we do use quite a bit more here in the U.S. than maybe the rest of the world does combined. But well, there's still quite a bit of pesticides used around the world in the major production areas. And it's increasing. And not only is pesticide use increasing, but genetic um, use of genetic engineer crops is increasing too. And, uh, and so if we look here at agriculture um, in the yellow, and then industry, commercial, garden, those might be the ones that are applying uh, uh, products for you or maybe um, a government industry. And then home and garden is that little brown uh, kind of color there. Um, a lot of pesticides are used by homeowners. And here in 2001, and, uh, we, we had around 10% of the total herbicide, insecticide, fungicides being used at the homeowner level. And then if you think about uh, uh, the concentration of that amount of product, close to, uh, close to around 150 million pounds, um, you know, so again, that's that could be like a half a pound or more product uh, uh, around the homes of, of all of us. And so that's probably pretty equivalent to what's probably going to be found out in a crop field. So we use a lot of pesticides around where we live and and recreate. And so pesticides are not just agriculture. They're used by all of us. And uh, I think we really probably should look more at, um, you know, reducing pesticide use and using it certainly very prescriptively. Uh, IPM is all about that, understanding natural controls of pests, applied controls, integrated approaches, now with biointensive and new and emerging technologies, biorational, even now with transgenic crops and livestock. We're really moving, I think, 
um, to, uh, I think we're starting to reduce pesticide use. Um, and uh, so again, I, I think that, um, you know, maybe um, the pressure of organic production has changed our use strategy of some of these pesticides uh, moving forward. Of course, uh, most of those involved in organic agriculture don't think transgenics is the way to go either, but that seems to be way, where we're headed. Um, Plant-derived botanical insecticides. It started out around 1690. The first uh, use here in the U.S. was nicotine extracts from tobacco. Um, pyrethrums were used, actually uh, brought back to Europe by the Crusaders um, uh, when they were first found, used um, in Africa, West Africa, and Sub-Saharan Africa area, where they're at this African marigold, which naturally contains pyrethrum. And rotenone um, is was found in the jicama vine, South America. They used it actually for fishing uh, as a muscle paralyzer, a very good insecticide, and rotenone very common. Nicotine sulfate, 1909, was the first semi-synthetic um, botanically derived product where they essentially took nicotine with sulfuric acid and made nicotine sulfate. Nicotine sulfate has an LD50 value of 45, which makes it a lot more toxic than most of the things we currently use. It came out as Black Flag in 1909. And of course, there's a picture of Neem. Actually, there's a picture of some students that I went over to uh, Liberia with. And we were had a, a club at Maryland called Roots. And we were actually teaching and making neem oil um, out of that neem, uh, neem leaves and neem fruit, uh, which came out of Burma. But we were actually uh, spread out through the tropical regions and that uses a natural pesticide, neem, so very, as a direct We've got these um, resistant action committees, insecticide resistant action committee, um, IRAC, we have a FRAC, a fungicide resistant action committee, and an HRAC, herbicide resistant action committee. You might wanna look them up later and you'll find out you can get to these mode of action charts and you'll find out that these different families of, of chemistry then, you get a little more insight into how they are used, in this case, all the insecticides. And if you look down that nervous system group, You'll find that uh, we use a lot of them in that in that group, the carbamates, organophosphates. We're kind of phasing those out. Those were the cholinesterase inhibitors. Um, the uh, the uh, the group uh, um, group three here, the sodium channel modulators, um, pyrethrins are in that group. Also, DDT was in that group. The neonics are in the acetylcholine receptor antagonist uh, group of group four A. Those are the neonicotinoids. Uh, group five, also uh, acetylcholine uh, antagonist, uh, spinozid uh, product, um, and uh, avermectins, avermectins. And so we can see uh, we, use, we use a lot of these nervous agent groups, but we also use things like over here, midgut. That's a BT product. Uh, we use quite a bit of that. Um, we use um, multine and metamorphosis inhibitors, disruptors. Um, so, again, we have all these very specific um, products. Uh, that we fall, rotenone falls down here into these, this uh, group uh, 21 mitochondrial complex electron inhibitors of muscle peril, causes muscle paralysis. And so it's kind of interesting, I think, why would we have this, want to know these families so we can rotate these families and avoid resistance. That's why we're typically thinking about how important these different chemical families are. Here's cholinesterase inhibitors. And of course there's synaptic poisons. And they're ones we have to be very concerned about because we have the similar synapse as insects do. They function about the same. Thankfully, our, our uh, nerve system is protected by a, a sheath, kind of a myelian sheath. It's kind of, a, kind of a, a complex of fats and things that basically surrounds our nerves so that they're kind of protected. Insects don't have that luxury. And so they're very quickly overcome by a product like organophosphate and carbamates, even the pyrethroids to some extent. And so again, that's a, uh, a really good reason to understand. I actually was in Rwanda at this plant where they were extracting um, the botanical from the botanical, the flowers, that West African marigold that has very high concentrations of natural permethrin. And so that's a pretty scientific process. That's not just grind up the, the petals to get this oil. Uh, that was an, an ether and uh, different chemical complex of extraction from the plant. And of course, the uh, these natural pyrethroids, whether we extract them from a plant or whether we produce them in a laboratory, they stop and they stop that electric, electrical um, transmission of electron down the axon. And again, that myelin sheath that we have protects that. Uh, and so that's why we have a very high tolerance for pyrethroid insecticides, where insects don't typically. 
Nicotine, uh, nicotine receptor, um, basically a nicotine fits on the acetylcholine receptor site, so it's a mimic. And so that's how the neonics and nicotinoid products work. Also, the spinosad group functions in that way uh, too. So again, that's a synaptic poison. So it's good to know how these things work. Um, it's good to know when you're using these insects that they are nerve agents. Here's a product of imidacloprid, which is a neonic plus cyfluthrin, which is a fourth generation of uh, pyrethrin. And uh, that's a very good product that we finally got bed bug control with. So until they added that imidacloprid for home use, we were, we're losing the battle to bed bugs. And boy, if that wasn't uh, uh, exciting times uh, when people came in and they had no control options for bed bugs. For years, it would have been the organophosphates that kept the bed bugs down. And uh, of course, uh, we used them. We started using pyrethrins in, indoors. And eventually, we got resistance to all the pyrethroids. And so uh, it was the metacloprid then that kind of came in and became the game changer. So we can finally control bed bugs again. Um, but we probably are looking at in the future, some very interesting biorational approaches. And so here's um, uh, Gemstar. It's actually a virus for corn earworm. I used to spray sweet corn about every two to three days from silking to harvest uh, when we had high moth counts before BT corn. So boy, that was a that was an interesting time period to have to do all that spraying. But now we got some really interesting opportunities to do things different. This product actually is OMRI approved, which means Organic Material Review Institute approved for the National Organic Program, which means if you're a sort of certified organic grower and want to grow sweet corn, this might be a good way to combat um, earworm. Of course, most of our sweet corn now has, uh, what, what, is, what is in most of our sweet corn now that we eat? Not many, not too many people. We don't spray our sweet corn like we did. So what do we do to our field corn and sweet corn to make it fairly insect uh, 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 insect free, we really uh, control corn borer, corn root worm, corn air worm, army worm. So it's that BT genetically engineered stuff, right? Even our sweet corn now is predominantly BT. So genetic engineering, that's the, uh, that's where we're going to go. I think into the future, we're getting so good at the, having the ability now to make great innovations in the engineering gene editing uh, approaches. And so not only are we inserting genes, which would be transgenic, that's when you take the genes of another species and insert it, like the BT gene of bacterial BT, Bacillus thuringiensis, take that gene out that expresses a protein that's toxic to, to Lepidopteran, the, the caterpillar, and the beetle, Coleoptera species, right? And so this protein then is what's something we digest, and now corn produces it, just like the bacteria, and it uh, really doesn't change anything about the corn other than it's toxic to the beetles and, and, ca and caterpillars. The amazing thing about that, that is transgenic. Then there's also things called cis cisgenic. Cisgenic means where you just edit the genes within its plant itself. Um, and so that way, uh, we typically think of cisgenic more like natural breeding, but now we can actually take genes out of the same species. So that would be cisgenic and very rapidly make the changes that we want. Or we can uh, turn on and turn off uh, genes so we can change gene function. That's pretty amazing how far we've come. We really didn't, this isn't something that we invented, uh, which is really amazing when it comes to genetic engineering. The natural world's been doing it all the time. Agrobacterium, viruses, a lot of these things right under our noses uh, have been all doing all kinds of gene, gene swapping, inserting, and manipulating. We developed this thing called the gene gun. I remember I was in, in agronomy at University of Maryland, and we had a discussion on the gene gun. And most of the professors were pretty like, they, they didn't think it was possible. And really, what they the gene gun, the first gene gun was a Crossman air pistol. They took spheres of tungsten spheres. They made these very hollow, small spheres, if you can imagine, kind of droplet-sized tungsten spheres. And they denatured the DNA material and then basically used a shotgun approach to shoot it into callous tissue of, uh, and figure somehow that this, this tissue was going to get in and, and uh, DNA swap, right? Uh, and most people were pretty scoffed, much of scoffers. So no, this will never work. And Monsanto almost gave up. In fact, they did, were at it for a decade before they finally made it work. And uh, when they made it work, uh, they had taken the genes uh, uh, that were of a tolerant species to Roundup and had inserted them into soybean. They raised that callus tissue and then eventually were able to interbreed that into all the different lines of soybeans so you can have a, a Roundup resistant uh, soybean. And that hit the market in 1996. I remember I was a decalb seed salesman in 1996 and we had a meeting 
actually in 1995, we had the meeting about, we're going to bring these new Roundup pretty soybeans into the market. We're going to give you all 20%. Do your best to sell them. <laughs> and we'll see how much we're going to have for the next year. Well, <laughs> I didn't have any problem selling them. And then that's all anyone wanted the next year, right? So now we had, they scrambled to try to produce enough Roundup Ready beans to make sales. I think they got up to around 60, 65% of our bean sales in Maryland by the, the second year. And then we were pretty much at 100% by the third year. So very, and this is because we recognize the very great utility of this Roundup Ready technology and how it's simplified, if you will, we control in agriculture. And again, genetically modified is not something we did Sweet potatoes are naturally um, tubers, natural tubers, because of agrobacterium DNA, which causes that uh, swelling, if you will, of the plant tissue. And a lot of the things, if we think of any kind of gall or any kind of uh, um, uh, either insect galls or fungal galls, well, that is genetic manipulation of the plant. And so, again, a, we're just, we just learned technology that's been going on all along. And we're finding as we go deeper into genomes, that we carry a lot of baggage genes, if you will, and a lot of those are uh, have been swapping uh, from species uh, over the uh, centuries. So unless the latest thing about gene editing is this new CRISPR uh, Cas9 test technology, the ability to kind of open the helix where we want to and very precisely make changes, not just uh, insert genes, but also basically basically to turn off genes. And uh, so again, very interesting and very precise. And so biotech, it's um, it's I think it's going to be the chain game changer as we go forward. And there's your difference between your BT and non-BT core, sweet corn. You know, I, I often tell my um, uh, my uh, my organic friends that they should pay a stipend. They should pay a stipend to every farmer that uses some of this uh, gene technology because they're essentially getting a much reduced population of insects because somebody else is paying that technology fee. So they really owe their farmers <laughs> for the uh, uh, the control of all the different uh, corn worm, corn ear worm, corn borer, and all the different uh, bug species out there from um, the farmers that actually do pay uh, for those technology fees, right? That was another big debate when we, when Cobb started was how much would farmers be willing to pay in tech fees? And I think uh, we had about a $25 tech fee that first year. We thought that was going to be too much. <laughs> and um, on a bag of soybeans and uh and lo and behold people didn't squawk at all they signed off on that pretty quick and paid that tech fee to get that roundup ready technology so again so that tech fee uh i tell our organic friends that they owe their farmers that are using these uh, these genetic traits because they're getting a lot more reduced uh, pr uh problems in their own farm the um and they're also, the organic friends are also allowed to spray BT. So I say, really, they're getting the same endotoxin, right? Uh, whether you spray it on there or whether you, uh, uh, it's produced in the plant. The, um, but what, there's really, here's a list of what's currently being used in the U.S. Uh, that's been genetically modified. We got a new apple, potato. We got, of course, field canola, canola field corn, canola, alfalfa, soybeans, papaya. And papaya was actually the first. Uh, in the world, it was given for free. A lot of the technology was actually given to the world by free, for free. And a lot of the world, the technologies now that we've been using for uh, genetic patents have uh, expired. And so uh, the world's getting it for free too now. So again, I think we've been very gracious with this technology over time. And uh, of course, uh, there's your different traits there of some of the crops that are being used and the percent now of the U.S. agriculture that is using these traits. And so again, pretty, pretty, uh, uh, pretty a, a important adoption. So genetic engineer crops. I like genetic engineering better than genetically modified because it really is about engineering, I think, of the genomes. And here's, look, look at how quickly they were adopted. Um, you can see herbicide tolerant soybeans, how quickly they went right up and, you know, into that close to that 100% level. Uh, cotton, corn, all a little bit slower trend, but still ended up there. Um, as we get to, to now, it's a very high concentration. And then when we first started to look at genetically modified crops, certainly the U.S. was the big player. But Argentina, Canada, Brazil, China, and South Africa were still pretty important players in the genetic, accepting genetically modified crops. And of course, what's happened now, U.S. isn't that big predominant player anymore. We still got, we're getting um, other countries that are popping in. In fact, it's being adopted more uh, by the third world countries 
as this technology um, fees have gone down for some of that earlier type of um, uh, genetic modifications. And when uh, I look at the adoption around the globe, you can see it's really starting to occur now. Uh, the, of course, the Americas, both North America and South America, are very early adopters. The Asian area and then Australia, very, very early adopters. Um, there was reluctance in Europe, although that reluctance is changing pretty quickly now, and then the reluctance in Africa so, and, and the Soviet Union. But those things are changing. Um, and so, again, uh, it's very quickly being adopted around the world. And uh, so, again, Rwanda is this little um, spot right down here. And this is Burundi, and this is Uganda right here, Rwanda, Uganda. And so we're starting to see um, this adoption. Here I am in, in Uganda. And uh, yeah, hold on just a second. Let me get my dog here. So in Uganda, the uh, we were at the lady down the red. She's the farmer. And Chuck uh, Schuster, he's extension agent from Montgomery County. We were in Uganda, and that's army worm infestation in Uganda. The interesting thing about that is that it um, it it was basically an invasive insect. It's the first time they had army worm in Uganda, and I told him that there's, you know, we were there with Sam. They're not going to spray this farm. Poor farmer is not going to spray her way out of this army worm problem. So you can imagine what I was telling them that the only answer to this. Because this is on the tropics, this is right on the equator. There, would, the army worm would continue to breed all year long. The BT corn was the only option. She could, you couldn't want this poor farmer to have to backpack spray this corn all the time. And here we are actually talking. That's my daughter there in the in the white uh, shirt. There, she's sitting next to me. She's a biologist, and we were working with these Ugandan farmers. And uh, we actually looked at several crops there, and it was almost always genetic engineering that was going to be the answer. And uh, actually talked to a senator there, and uh, they were actually going to have a vote in Kampala, which is the capital city of Uganda, on whether or not to accept GMO products. And uh, I told him, I said, well, these farmers can't go out and spray their way out of this problem. Tanzania just accepted BT. You'd be prudent to accept it and improve and make sure your colleagues understand the importance of that to the farm community. And I came back two weeks later and the, they voted yes to adopt the genetic engineer crops. And so I like to think that this, this group talking with these farmers and talking with the Senator there had some, had some influence on that decision. This is a uh, inside of Masika, Uganda, their, their trading store for agricultural chemicals and uh, tools, equipment, fertilizers and things. And so I thought, you know, I was working on a project there in Uganda and I needed a, a couple, I needed one fungicide, one insecticide. We were planting some tomatoes and peppers and eggplant for a, for a school there project. And I wanted a farm project there and with the farmers talking about IPM. And lo and behold, when I got into this little shop, I thought, holy cow, they've got everything. And what's amazing about what they had is everything was packaged, typically made in either, um, they were either produced in Pakistan, India, or China. And, uh, and what was amazing, they were in all in small packages. I could get small packages of just about every chemical that I, you could imagine um, in basically in almost in like a four ounce or five ounce, six ounce package. And so I thought that was really amazing. Here we had to buy, you know, a two and a half jug, gallon jug of everything, but they had it packaged in very small quantities, which I thought for those small scale farmers, you know, those kind of family farmers, that's perfect. Um, that's a perfect way for them to get product. Um, to expend only what they need and not have to have this long shelf life and storage problems of some of these products. But up here in the big jugs is uh, Cucosate, Cucosate. And then, of course, that's glyphosate, Chinese glyphosate. And then they had a 2,4-D and they had a paraquat there. So I thought that was interesting that you could, you could buy bulk uh, some of these bigger chemicals um, in there. They also had up here, you see they had a sprayer mask and a respirator. I had a backpack sprayer, a respirator. So I went ahead and bought them a respirator, some spray gloves, and I bought them a backpack sprayer, and I bought them one uh, um, chlorothalonil, one fungicide, and I bought permethrin, one uh, insecticide, so they could keep their eggplant, peppers, and tomatoes clean for the season. So the school kids would have some good produce uh, in the community, too. You know, um, and we dive deeper into this genetic engineering. I think the future is really fascinating. Uh, of course, Monsanto is owned by Bayer now, but while, before Monsanto was purchased by Bayer, they were working on a project called BioDirect, 
And I saw some slides here from an Australian presentation. I think it's really interesting. And so um, before we go any further, let's go ahead and put our second course word down here. And uh, I'm going to um, I'm going to make our second course word biochemistry because I really think uh, biochemistry is is ultimately what we should focus on uh, when we think about pesticides. We really need to uh, uh, just uh, we just have to make sure that we emphasize that. I think I spelled it right. I can't quite see it. There it is. I think it's right. Biochemistry. That's our second course word. So let's go ahead and put that down. Biochemistry. Everyone got that? Give me a check mark. Still awake? <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> hope you're enjoying the pictures anyway and enjoying the and enjoying the little thoughts about uh, some of this, this uh, where we're going, where we're headed in, in agriculture. The um, DNA, if we looked at this, um, this is really interesting study, this study of messenger RNA and RNA, I, RNA interference. Um, we're actually going to look future, going into the future, we're going to actually turn on, turn on and off plant resistance mechanisms um, so that we make our sprays more effective. So let's say we have a resistant weed um, to, uh, uh, to glyphosate, is it possible to turn it back, turn that resistance mechanism off? And, um, and of course, um, soybeans, really, when you think about it, soybeans have been genetically engineered to be resistant to Roundup, right? So it's kind of like that resistant weed almost, uh, our, our Roundup ready soybeans are resistant to Roundup. And what is it that makes it resistant? And so I thought that, I thought that's interesting. I always thought, well, what makes Roundup work anyway? And that's very interesting in itself. It happens to be that um, that EPSPS enzyme is um, ever like everything. Um, we run messenger RNA through a rib ribosome in a, in a cell. That's whether it's a plant or whether it's us or whether any living organism. And out comes proteins, right? And so uh, we think about uh, you know we use the we understand how we take all the essential amino acids and we use those as building blocks and the, these proteins are being produced, right? And so, um, and that's done through the ribosome and this RNA transcription process. So DNA splits, messenger RNA peels off, goes into the ribosome, and out comes something, some product, right? Some protein product. In this case, EPSPS enzyme is what glyphosate inhibits. So it's a very important enzyme only in plants that photosynthesize. So since we don't photosynthesize, glyphosate has no function, if you will, uh, if it gets inside us, not that we want it inside of us, us, but it has no function, so it's pretty readily eliminated. Thank goodness. But if we, um, but plants, on the other hand, um, glyphosate. When we apply glyphosate, um, it goes in and it binds with this EPS enzyme that makes it non-functional. And if we put enough glyphosate in there, essentially we make no uh, none of that enzyme functional, and then that rest and glyphosate then stops photosynthesis because it's an essential. Uh, 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 protein or enzyme in, in photosynthesis. And so if you think about that, that's what happens when you put Roundup on a plant that's not resistant. It immediately stops photosynthesizing, right? It starts to yellow, 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 until eventually, because it can't photosynthesize anymore, uh, and the glyphosate is still present inside the plant, and it's systemic, then the plant basically die, gives up, right? Die, no photosynthate, so the plant starves to death. It yellows, turns brown, and dies. And it's very functional because it's systemic, goes throughout the entire plant, stops the process. Now, what happens if the plant produces is more of the messenger RNA, produces an abundance, overabundance of EPSPS enzyme? Essentially, that's what we genetically bred soybeans to do. They produce so much EPSPS enzyme that no how much glyphosate we put in there, we can't bind at all. And so photosynthesis still continues. And so that's how. All the plants, whether they're resistant or whether we engineer them to be resistant, like our Roundup Ready soybeans, um, they basically glyphosate no longer lethal. And so, so what happens then if we have a process where we could add an RNA interference molecule in with the glyphosate, theoretically, and actually in the laboratory it works, we could actually put that um, RNA interference in there. And that would come in there then and actually bind up the that abundance of that messenger RNA, essentially shut down this, um, this protein factory for the EPSPS. And essentially, whether it would be a soybean or whether it be a resistant plant, if we put that RNA interference in there, we can essentially turn off that abundance of EPS enzyme and glyphosate, hence we kill the plant again. 
So again, messenger RNA, that's going to be kind of the, the future. We're going to turn mechanisms on and off in plants and make herbicides um, either work again or maybe work um, uh, in the way of, uh, you know, basically a, a switching mechanism. And dicamba tolerant soybeans, that was really interesting too, right? And here's a picture of, at the Y Research and Education where Ron Ritter ran the first test of dicamba tolerant soybeans. And he got, he called over and said, you got to see this isn't real, putting all this dicamba on. And uh, no effect, no impact on these soybeans, which everyone knows dicamba kills soybeans. And then I, I think in my mind, well, how in the world is that possible? How can a soybean that wasn't, that would have been killed dead by dicamba, now all of a sudden, they genetically engineered this plant so that you could put dicamba on it. Doesn't that, didn't that blow your mind trying to think, well, okay, how's that, well, how did that happen? How, what they do? And it was interesting. It was led by a, a professor at the University of Lincoln, Nebraska, Dr. Donald Weeks in his laboratory, laboratory licensed by Monsanto. There's always been known that if you sprayed um, um, uh, Banville, dicamba, on the soil, that it's broken down very quickly by, um, by, um, biologically by microbes. So microbes essentially eat um, the uh, dicamba. So dicamba typically doesn't persist more than about two to three weeks in the soil. Quickly broken down, organisms actually eat it. It's a food source. And because it shouldn't surprise us because benzoic acid, which is uh, what dicamba is, it's a benzoic acid. That's a natural plant acid. And, uh, and so essentially it would make sense that there would be some organism that would feed on it. And it happens to be this soil bacterium called Pseudomonas multifilia. And uh, so Dr. Donald Weeks uh, recognized that um, the reason why dicamba doesn't persist is because it's eaten by this soil microbe. And what is the process by which the soil microbe then can essentially digest, if you will, the benzoic acid? And it comes down that they actually found the genes that were responsible for the breakdown of the benzoic acid as a food source for the bacteria, took it out of the bacteria and put it in the soybean. And now the soybean essentially breaks down or digests that benzoic acid before it can do any damage, right? So pretty amazing technology, isn't it? It's, it's Again, it's just understanding the natural world and that the pseudomonas multifilia and the genes involved in that dicamba metabolic process. So pretty fascinating. Now our soybeans break down the benzoic acid. Benzoics are natural plants um, hormones. And so um, essentially we haven't changed any dynamics of the soybean other than now it, uh, it can break down dicamba from having the genes of a bacteria. And of course, now we have extend to max beans, right? That can, you can put dicamba on. And the same thing holds true with the phenoxy class, which is the 2,4-D, very similar process. And now we have the do a down list, the do a list beans, right? Fascinating, right? You know, I think it is. I think pesticides are fascinating. It's a very fascinating subject, and we need to be more educated, I think, as consumers on these topics, uh, because uh, most of us are disconnected from the farm and they no real understanding of the science behind uh, this, this technology. I was fortunate enough to be part of the no-till revolution. So I, I always kind of love to be part, have been part of that. Um, no-till revolution right here in Maryland. So I thought I'd give you a little, uh, some little insights on where we, we've come with no-till and how we got there. Uh, we all understood the benefits of, of soil organic matter and how quickly we depleted it um, during the plowing era, era. I'd say we probably did the most damage to our soils in a century <laughs> than could ever been fathomable um, from the time we invented the plow. Um, how much soil loss and, and soil organic matter loss, it's almost uh, contemptible to me to think of how much we damaged our soils in that short period of time, not just us two around the world. And as a veteran no-tiller, uh, it was great to go, have gone around the world and to discuss these issues of how we're going to rebuild these soils as vital resources going into the future. And I think that's what no-till really came to be. And now it's now it's it's even more important when we talk about sequestration of carbon and the reduction of CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, we, we've got a lot ahead of us to do. Um, so what started this no-till revolution? Well, the first no-tiller was um, Harry M. Young. He was from Herndon, Kentucky. He worked with the Kentucky University. And they got the name of Mr. No-Till. He started no-till in 1961, the year I was born. And uh, he said that... Uh, 
Uh, and a lot of people that said, well, this is never going to work. And when you think about it, he didn't have very many chemicals. Uh, he only had, um, he had 2,4-D, which came out in 1945 and from ag chemical uh, company, um, ag chem, uh, Amchem, which was the American chemical paint company. Our first herbicide was 2,4-D. We, um, we, we didn't, we had Paraquat discovered, but it wasn't used as a her, uh, insect, uh, herbicide until as a burn down product until 1962 when the Chevron company put it out. So Harry Young didn't have that. He had 2,4-D. He had Geig, he had Atrex and Princep. So he had Atrex and Princep, and he had um, he had uh, 2,4-D. And so uh, there were a lot of naysayers. He used, a, uh, I think, another product. Maybe it might have been um, out that time, Linuron. This is a little bit of a burn down, too. And so anyway, he had very few tools, but he recognized that we had to stop all this deep tillage. And it really came out of earlier visionaries, um, 1943. Uh, I think I got a slide here. You can see a little bit better, so let me go forward. So Harry Young's 1961, 1943, my hero, he wrote the book called Plowman's Folly. And Edward Faulkner um, was an extension agent, he lived through the Dust Bowl, and he recognized that, uh, hey, he, in fact, he even the major treaties of the book Plowman's Folly is that no one has ever advanced a scientific reason for plowing. And it was that deep tillage that he was, he was convinced that um, was the cause of the loss of soil organic matter topsoil in the U.S., and he's right, that's what it was. Uh, he recognized that shallow tillage, only enough for weed control. Think about this. This is before any herbicide. So he knew there had to be tillage, but shallow tillage would be much beneficial. And he was kind of the early father, I think, of the reduced tillage movement. And then you had um, Bennett Hammett, uh, Hammett Bennett, which was the father of soil conservation after the formation of the USDA Soil Conservation Service in 1935. He also, too, knew that we had destroyed the short grass prairies by tillage and irreparable, and probably haven't, still haven't recovered from that uh, damage. In uh, 1950s and 1960s, the early no-till years, they started to reduce tillage with disc and, and chisels and offhead calder hairs and tried to do more shallow type tillage like uh, Faulkner said had to be done. And really the, the first ones to go into no-till, um, inspired by Kentucky uh, with Harry Young, but Indiana, North Carolina, Virginia, New Jersey, Maryland, Ohio, Kentucky, these were the leaders in the world and still and remain the leaders in the world for a long time in no tillage. And uh, again, we started getting some good chemicals. Lasso came out in 1969. And then glyphosate in 1974 was first created in 1970, um, discovered by a researcher, Dr. John France from Monsanto. The... Um, and here's a picture of the Naval Academy dairy farm where I farmed, and we were pretty proud in 1995. By 1995, we were zero tillers. I came in as crops master in about 1987, was a field hand up from 1980 to 1987, but we were committed that by 1987 to 100% no-till and essentially zero till. And that's 88 crop strips over about 846 acres there um, that we basically committed to 100% no-till. And we had, I'm not gonna say it was without its trials, uh, back then, it was called farming ugly, and uh, and we really the, we were trying to catch up with equipment technology. We had the herbicide technology, we still hadn't quite got the planters perfected yet. And so, the first no-till planters arrived in Maryland were the Alice Chalmers in 1966. They were the first no-till planters. We actually had a six-row unit that looked just like that one in the picture. And I've certainly used those in the past. I wish I would have hung on to it. I wish I would have went to the sale and bought it. Uh, the old six-row Alice that we had that first came to the farm in 1968. Our 1966. Um, and uh, back then um, in the, at the Naval Academy, um, Dr. Mr. Bill Tidings was, was one of the early, uh, uh, I guess you'd say, promoters of no-till. There was a lot of them across Maryland at that time. They were st started the uh, really get into this no-till era. The U.S. NAD crops master, Mr. George, he had to retire because he was unable to adapt and Orville took over and Orville was my predecessor. He was crops master there until I took over in 87. And we really worked hard at, uh, at making no-till work. And uh, we were pretty proud. We had a great team of us. Of course, it was kind of fun to go to all those no-till meetings, talk about farming ugly, and, and uh, it was just a lot of fun back there in the in mid 80s and 90s. And um, again, he, when finally we got the Roundup Ready technology, and so that really started to increase the adoption of no-till. And we got into more very prescriptive IPM versus these machines. Here's a picture of the dairy going through some heavy residue and, and rye cover. And again, actually, that's about uh, that's about 15% uh, tillage. 
uh, lacrosse that field. No-till is considered anything less than 25% of the soil disturbed. Uh, but a good strategic use of row cleaners and aggressive uh, tillage uh, row cleaners can actually uh, get you into about 15% tillage of a field. And that gets you into kind of what I call a zone tillage. Still a very good no-till system. And there's a picture of that uh, close-up of going into those, those no-till planters, right? And there's my favorite, uh, that was my favorite implement there, besides the Kinsey brothers inventing the gauge wheel system that's on that John Deere. Is that no-till yet or Coulter uh, and uh, trash wheel? And so again, when Yetter combined that that Coulter and trash wheel together with the bearing, without the bearing, with the hubs on the bearings so they wouldn't wrap, finally had something we didn't have to worry about going through the field and having wrap. Uh, to me, that was perfection. And uh, at that point, we we there was no turning back. And then we came out with the 750 no-till drill with the gauge wheel systems on it. There we had everything we needed. Here's a picture of 1991. I went out in the morning. Now, normally when we took alfalfa out of production, we would have plowed and disc and disc and disc and disc and disc and rolled until we got it ready to put small grain or corn in, right? And so that would have been the old days, right? But no-tillers go out in the morning, like I did that morning on September 28th, 1991, put on a quart of alfalfa, uh, uh, um, glyphosate roundup and uh, probably a, a pint of 24d came back the afternoon same day there's my spray tracks come back and i drilled in with that drill there barley and then come back uh 30 days later october 28th the alfalfa is dead the barley is coming up but that's not the beautiful thing about this the beautiful thing is there's no soil loss which if i would have plowed that and had any kind of a rain which i knew it would have had i'd had a mud trail all the way down through that pasture down into that stream and not only that, that next year, I didn't put any nitrogen on that fall, nor did I put nitrogen on in the spring, nor did I put any additional extra nitrogen on at harvest to harvest time. And only I would three-way split nitrogen on, on barley or wheat. And there I am harvesting that barley. And uh, there we are weighing it. And we got 119 bushel barley with zero nitrogen. Now, any person, any farmer knows that you don't grow that with zero nitrogen. So where'd that nitrogen come from? We captured it all from that alfalfa crop. That's the highest barley yields I ever had. In fact, that's not the highest I had in that system. I went all the way up to 122 bushel uh, per acre and uh, over 125 bales of straw uh, and never applied any nitrogen. And that, to me, that was probably the best system for coming out clean out of uh, alfalfa into a, into a grain, back into a grain rotation. So again, it was pretty fantastic. And I, I live this philosophy, not just in the farming, but even there's my garden, right? So there's some crimson rye in my little kitchen garden at my house. And so again, and, and I hope to take some of these same philosophies uh, into our urban farming center as we go, go forward. So again, applied control, biological, um, you know, humans are basically, we get involved in, in these applied pest controls. We use things like biological, cultural, host resistance, mechanical control, regulatory control because we're required to, and then chemical control uh, because uh, we're monocropping typically, and we typically can't control everything, even with the best tactics in there. So sometimes we use very prescriptively and hopefully as a last resort, the pesticide. And I think that's what IPM is all about. So if we think about an ecosystem, an agro ecosystem, then I think, you know, we think about man-managed ecosystems. And so, again, um, uh, that's really uh, what a, an ecosystem, an agroecosystem is, an ecosystem that has constraints that we put on it because we're going to try to grow a singular crop, right? Or, uh, and so um, a garden or a pasture or a natural ecosystem doesn't have those constraints. And so we have to have, as we put controls in there, we lose some of those natural feedback mechanisms because... Typically, in an ecosystem, you wouldn't have a, a stand of corn. That typically doesn't happen on its own. And so we have to be involved in that. And as we get into these more complex systems and put more human controls and inputs in, we typically lose those natural feedback mechanisms and control. And so we can anticipate pests can be more problematic as the more complex a system gets. So herbicides, insecticides, fungicides, attempt to use the most reduced risk pesticides and, uh, and very strategically. Integrated pest management is a sustainable approach which combines the use of biological, cultural, physical, and chemical tactics in a way that minimizes health and environmental risks. And it is kind of a philosophy, right? And, my, and I like to stress that it's pest management, not pesticide management. I'll admit, when I first started farming, I was guilty 
uh, thinking of integrated pest management as kind of a pesticide management philosophy. I got all these pesticides in the storeroom. I'm going to kind of manage how I use them when I really should be thinking about the pest itself and then think about all those other tactics uh, and then not just thinking about what pesticide I'm going to use. So we really got to think of it as pest management, not pesticide management. And so again, it's kind of a, a philosophy switch. Um, generally, when we think of pests, generally about 2% or less of all species present on any agroecosystem are really considered pests. So it's really most of the things out there are either benign or beneficial, or but they're not pests. And so we really want to protect all those other species and things. And economic injury level is the most important part of, uh, of learning about IPM strategy for pesticide applications. Economic injury level was developed by Pedigo in 1989, when he basically said that the economic injury level is where the cost of control equals the benefit of the control. And that you don't want to wait till that point because you're already lost money. You want to go ahead and make your application ahead of that, which would be the action or treatment threshold. It's usually set at 80% of the economic injury level. So we use that then to go ahead and know when to spray. And we can use, anytime you can use mathematics, that's the only true science. Every other science is subjective to some, to some extent, but mathematics is not. Mathematics is very precise. And if we can model something very precisely, then we can get closer to the truth, right? And so if, pest, if we look at pest density over time, and we think about pest density over time, then uh, the cost of control is uh, pest density equals the cost of control over the value of the crop times the damage. Now, the damage, I will admit, is the most difficult thing to assign to any pest uh, quantity. And so, again, but we know the value of the crop and we know how much it costs and we can, we can monitor the pest density. And once we know the damage potential, then we can start to understand mathematically when to make sprayer applications, right? Here's some potato leaf hopper and alpha, alpha injury. And so we can see that if it's uh, the crop is valued at fifteen dollars, uh, the cost the treatment costs fifteen dollars an acre to spray for uh, potato leaf hopper, and then the value of the crop is three hundred dollars per acre, and we typically think about a ten percent loss per assigned to a leaf hopper per leaf hoppers per sweep. And then it works out that the economic injury is 0.5 potato leaf hoppers per sweep. But what that means that means fifty per hundred sweeps. So if I go out and do ten sets of ten. And uh, my my uh, my economic injury loss would be 50. I want to treat at 40, so that would be when I would make my spray application. So again, and we also know by looking at this mathematics, what happens if the treatment then cost was 30 dollars? Then I would actually allow it would be one potato leaf hopper per sweep would be the economic injury level, and then 0.8 potato leaf hoppers or 80 per hundred would be my treatment threshold because the crop the cost is so much higher. So again, very interesting dynamics at play here. So we go back to that picture of that lady there. She army worm and her corn, 35% of the plants with 50% defoliation and the larva is less than three quarter. That's the treatment threshold. Now we have to determine by monitoring whether or not she's at that point. And again, we also have to predict if the worms are half inch, we know they're going to consume a lot more. If they're greater than three quarters of an inch, then we know that likely they're going to go into pupation and we might avoid a period of, of, of large feeding loss. And so, again, it's these things, these thresholds are very important. And we monitor and we hear them sweep net and teach them how to sweep net in Uganda. So we have a lot of tools out there, even the Padres standing back by, behind the farmer here getting her using her sweep net. So we had a lot of fun there. And then we can use that sweep net thresholds to know exactly when to spray. So pretty, it's all science, right? I like to, I like to think that uh, we're we're there with this science. Of course, Paraquat. And I don't know if any many of you use Paraquat. We know now that we have to have uh, training since July 2021 required us to have uh, also some new regulations. It's prohibited to use Paraquat in a backpack now. Um, you had required uh, a respirator, uh, the PF10 or the N N95 respirators. Um, face shields and goggles when mixing Paraquat. Of course, closed container systems now have been developed and you have to have the required training. So again, make sure you've done your training for Paraquat. It's required every three years now if you're using Paraquat and you'll get your certificate that allows you from the EPA then to, to use Paraquat. Another thing that's very important is tar spot and corn. I want to keep an eye out for that, especially if it was reported up in Harford County last year, I think, for the first time. 
And so, again, very important, Sam, to keep an eye out for this one. Well, of course, across the state, it's been showing up in Pennsylvania, mainly in um, tester plots in for seed companies. And so we're um, probably because they have varieties that don't have as much resistance, and maybe it's because uh, it's coming in on the seed, too, on these tester plots. So keep in mind, keep an eye out for this one. Very much looks like a tar spot on there that's not easily um, removed off. Uh, so keep an eye out for that tar spot. Uh, you really want to be concerned about it if it's early in the cropping cycle because it can dramatically reduce, kind of like gray leaf mold um, congrat, uh, or gray leaf spot. It can grant, it really can dramatically drop yields if it's in that uh, filling fill time uh, for the or, uh, the ear. Also, if you're making corn silage, it can be a uh, real, really drop the quality of that corn silage um, uh, very quickly. So watch out for this one. Uh, and it hasn't been ranked number one all the time, but it was ranked number one problem in 2021 in the Corn Belt. And so, again, keep an, keep an eye out for that if you haven't uh, been paying attention. Tar spot over winter. So if you do get tar spot, you probably would want to do a little tillage because burying that residue is very important to reducing the inoculum of that. Because once you get the inoculum, it will carry forward in residue. So that's another one to watch out for. Tar spot management. Um, there are uh, periods when... Uh, fungicides can uh, be required. So also know exactly when um, those, those things, they have shown uh, some significant increase in yield when appropriately timed. And so keep that in mind. Another one to be concerned about is Palmer amaranth. Make sure that thing's on the move around the state. That's one we don't have no tolerance for. It's a noxious weed list now. It means we're required to control it. And all your farmer friends would be glad when you get out there and, and take control of this one too. So don't let even one plant get loose out there. If you get out there and get them ahead of time, you'll be much better off. This is an outbreak in Southern Maryland where it went unnoticed. And next thing you know, you got an old field of it. So learn the differences between Palmer. It has no hairs. It's smooth. And uh, it uh, even it's even no hairs. Even smooth pigweed has more hair than Palmer. So it's a very smooth plant. Uh, it's petiole. Um, this leaf, leaf petiole is longer than the leaf itself. That's a very, also very telltale for Palmer. And the female plant has these, they're not quite spikes. They're not like the spiny amaranth, but they're a little bit prickly. They won't break the skin, but you'll certainly know, notice them. And so that's a telltale of the female plant. The male plants don't have that. And they do have a male female plant. Again, spiny amaranth, we all understand that one, right? Prostrate pigweed or spiny amaranth. That does have a spine. And a lot of times when early growth, spiny amaranth looks a little bit like um, the Palmer. So I've had people call me out thinking they have Palmer and they had spine, young spiny amaranth. So very can be easily uh, confused. And uh, so again, the telltale way is very smooth stem, kind of early poinsettia-like growth, longer petiole than the leaf, very long seed heads. Of course, we don't want to develop those seed heads out there. Certainly make sure we get them before they have viable seed. And then they sometimes have water marks, but that's not always the case. Also, another thing to be worried about is ticks. And uh, make sure, of course, we all know that we had a pretty mild winter. Deer ticks kind of been, I've been active all year, as far as I know. My dog's had them, and I've had them all, all winter long. So you're in Southern Maryland. So again, it's uh, um, yeah, without winter, maybe without winters as fear as we, as we normally have, these ticks can be active, especially the black-legged deer tick can be um, uh, active all year. So make sure you keep an eye on that. And uh and all the different diseases they carry. In fact, in fact, one of my colleagues got Rocky Mountain spotted tick fever this uh, this year, and I thought, wow, I haven't heard of that one for a long time. And so there are a lot of things going on out there. And I think it's the um, is the lone star, the meat allergy with the lone star tick, the alpha gal. So again, good reason why you might want to know those different ticks and be able to ID them. It's good to have a hand lens with you. And one more tick that you need to be looking out for is this new longhorn tick. It's just an Asian, it's called the Asian longhorn tick. Um, it's also known as the bush tick or cattle tick. It really does predominantly like cattle, but it will get on our pets. And, and it's a congratory, congratory tick, which means that no, normally when we get a tick, we might get one or two, but when you get a hundred of them at one time, look out for this one. It's a soft body tick. So it's very distinctively different. Doesn't have that real telltale um, sputum in here. So again, it's got, um, it's, it's in there, but it's not, it's all real soft body tick. And they tend to throw those first pair of legs out like horns. And so that behavior has earned them the name Longhorn. And they're kind of this dull reddish brown. 
And uh, they're very, uh, very interesting uh, congratory ticks. So you're going to get 100 or more of them at one time when you get in a nest of them. They really are very interesting that way. They actually cause cattle to become anemic, and they also carry cattle uh, tick fever. So again, uh, very one to keep, out, keep an eye on your cattle. Of course, uh, permethrin clothing, uh, DEET, and all these other things are probably the best way. Some people are even using uh, 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 permethrin um, uh, cotton balls to basically try to break the cycle of the deer tick by treating the mice. Most of those seed ticks are on mice first, then they move to um, larger animals and deer. So if we control them with the mice, if we control the mice population, if we can also control the deer tick at the mice population, we might break that cycle down a little bit. Of course, with our animals, we're putting on our uh, ear tags and we're also putting on porons, right, to control those ticks and other um, Newsome insects. And we did the paraquat. Uh, so last thing, so let's go ahead and uh, let's do our third course word. And what are we going to put down there? Oh, heck, let's put longhorn tick, just so we keep an eye out for it. Longhorn tick. Let me know. I got to spell it right here. I think I got it right. Yeah, longhorn tick. It's just something else for us to look out for. If you do see it, contact the extension or MDA. Because we are trying to figure out exactly where it is. I think it's been noted so far in uh, St. Mary's County. Maybe it's, out, maybe it's out there in some other places too. Anyone see it? Anyone have longhorn tick on any other livestock? Did you, did you, Joseph, have longhorn tick? The, um, give me a check mark if you got that third course word. We're almost home free. Doing pretty good too, I think. So let's go ahead and uh, just some updates from MDA. Um, program manager right now, pesticide regulation section is Rob Hofstetter. Um, actually, Sweda has now been replaced. I can't remember the new person. They got a new person now as part of certification and training. Uh, I should have updated that slide. Administrative office, when you call them, is Jessica Kuntz and Hannah Pete down there. Typically, you'll answer the phones. And Kelly Love, the number of inspectors there, and the inspector supervisor at Burnell Argo. The, um, of course, those are different regions where you have your different inspectors. Uh, Joseph said his mom got Lone Star. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's terrible. And I heard a number of people have gotten that. That's terrible. The um, Comar, if you've never seen the regulation book for pesticide regulation, um, you can get it online. Uh, or you can actually have contacted the department, MDA, and they'll mail you a copy of the Comar. So if you'd like to have that in your library, that's a state law on pesticide use. FD, uh, EPA um, has been grant, granted the states the rights then to, um, to oversee the pesticide program in the state at the state level. And that's why our state agency at MDA takes that on. And... Uh, uh, pesticide applicators, it's, you know, we do have private, which we, what we're doing tonight, private applicator training, but there are commercial applicators. And, and in fact, uh, uh, the core, this is core manual. We're going over core manual material. And so uh, essentially the training tonight is core manual material for private and commercial pesticide applicators. And it's for credits. But, and of course, with private people, you only need private applicators. You only need four credits every three years. Commercials need eight credits every year, right? So a big difference between commercial and private applicators. Renewals, um, we're, they're, they're trying to get you to renew online. So that's the best way to do it now. And they send out the postcard. It looks something like this, renew your pesticides today. And so don't throw that postcard away because you have your license number there and your renewal number. And so when you go online to renew, which after this course, wait a couple of weeks and uh, you should, it should show up when you go online to review that you've taken this course. And then you'll, when you populate the, the course in that, um, in that, uh, in your online renewal, then basically you'll, they'll say that you had your, your training and you can go ahead and use that renewal number, pay your set, pay your $7 fee, and then you'll be recertified for three more years. It's an online portal. You can go right to the MDA department and get that, get to that. And of course, I'm going to send in your um, 
your piece of paper that you filled out tonight, right? And uh, and so again, keep that keep that in mind. And um, here's uh, uh, again. So that's your you make sure you want to sign that in. Make sure you put your registration your your certification number on there. So that's really important too. The um, some interesting things legislatively, uh, of course, we know that uh, chlorpyrifos now is uh, not allowed to be used in Maryland anymore. It's prohibited uh, to be used. Neonicotinoids are only used in agriculture now. So again, that's a big change and only indoor. So that indoor bug, uh, bed bug product that I showed earlier is still allowed for the homeowner market, but it's not, it's not allowed to use outdoors, mainly for the P Pollinator Protection Act of Maryland that was uh, went into effect in October 1st of 2021. So the Pollinator Protection Act basically um, in Maryland has phased out uh, these products, these neonicotinoid products uh, for the use in garden, turf, lawn, and everything except agriculture and indoor use, indoor pesticide use. And that's also, again, to try to avoid uh, the law bee loss and protection of, of our pollinators. The um, there is could be some interesting changes that will go in effect probably within uh, now within six months. Uh, this slide came out last fall, so now within six months, probably by the fall, we're going to see um, uh, the idea that the, basically any restricted use product will um, will all um, users of those restricted use products will have to be a certified applicator, no longer allowed to be supervised. So that's a big change. Um, again, so again, this is a, this was a federal change, not just a Maryland change. So Maryland will adopt that because it's a federal change. They're looking at atrazine, some more label changes for atrazine, um, some more restrictions probably going to come down the pike. Uh, very interesting restriction that's going to read in the new label that says prohibit application to saturated soils of atrazine, also prohibit application during rain or when a storm event is forecasted within 48 hours. That's pretty difficult. Uh, pretty difficult task sometimes to know when it's going to rain within 48 hours. And um, again, uh, re dec decreasing the rate. And I think two pounds is probably a sufficient amount of active ingredient that most of us aren't applying more than that anyway. So we're going to see some different, some changes there. They also, hopefully you did your pesticide use survey. I know I completed mine, sent it in. I hope you had a chance to do that and send that in. The reason they had done that in COVID, but they only had a 46% response. And so they decided to do it right, do it again. And, um, but the farmers did, did have the highest response rate. 74% of the farmers and ag operators responded. So let's hope we get up around 90% this time and, uh, and the rest of them come, in, come on board and we get better than 60, 70% total. Then we'll have a really good idea of the use of pesticides. That's the only way we really know how much product is actually um, used and what sectors and how you know where it's being applied and so it's a very important survey so hope make sure you don't let that one sit any longer if it's still sitting get that into the department field watch is also very important uh, uh, the, to uh, keep in mind and uh, field watch is um, a way to uh, register your farm especially if you're a uh, specialty crop vegetable vineyard or what have you you might want to register your site or if you have beehives and really important Maryland's uh, uh, as part of Field Watch, it's a very big nationwide program now. And uh, complaints are up during the pandemic era, and I think they haven't uh, subsided. So people are really watching. Uh, there are a lot of people work from home now. And uh, so if they see the spray rig, sometimes they get more concerned because they wouldn't have been home in the past. And now they maybe they have a little more reason to call it a department. Anyway, complaints are up. And so we want to make sure we're doing our best out there to keep records, to do things very wisely when we make our applications and uh, avoid drift, right? That's our probably our biggest problem. Keep records too, very important. Records are required to keep be kept for two years. And so make sure you do that. In the event of any spills, you are required to, uh, to report that to the department. So even if it's on your own farm, you're supposed to report a spill. A hose pops off or whatever, and, and you have a little bit of a spill out there, you really should call MDA, let them know. So make sure that they don't want you to do anything anymore um, take any more precautionary steps. And so certainly if it happens out in public domain, you immediately call fire and police and make sure that uh, uh, they get uh, the proper appropriate response on that too. So uh, as fills are required, keep an eye out for spotter and lantern fly. And uh, the quarantine zone has really pretty much covered the state now. And so uh, it's really uh, become, becoming a menace, I think. Uh, 
uh, for some of us. And so, again, uh, that's another one we got to pay attention to. And if you're in the quarantine zone now, you have to become, if you're if you're moving trucks and things, um, you have to take some training, right, uh, to move tr trucks out of the quarantine zone into areas that aren't in quarantine. And that's the pesticide update. And let's see, what are we going to put our, as our fourth our fourth word here, fourth code word. And um, oh, let's see. I'll tell you what. How about UFRC? Uh, let's make it. Let's make it AAUFRC. And, and I'll just remind you earlier in the presentation, um, I shared with you the Urban Farm Research Clinic that I'm kind of having fun with, and Anne Arundel County Extension. So AAUFRC, the Anne Arundel Urban Farm Research Clinic. And if you know any. People that want to become farmers, and I'm not talking about gardeners now, I'm talking about farmers. Uh, I, I make that distinction. We have a master gardener program, but if they want to become farmers, then head them, send them my way, especially if they're on a small scale and want to try to maximize their profits and their, and their farming opportunity. The Anne Arundel Urban Farming Research Clinic. And um, anyway, we're, have, we're going to use it as a teaching tool and hopefully uh, uh, help, help, a lot of, help a lot of new farmers come on board. So that's a uh, that's it for, for tonight. You guys have any questions? We got uh, plenty of time here for questions, but uh, I won't belabor us any longer. Um, let, me, let me drop out the, let's go back to screen share for a minute. And I'm going to stop sharing here. The, also, to make sure you all you can find all this information on my website. So just go to Anna, Google Anne Arundel Extension if you'd like to see any slide sets or any things that I have shared. <laughs> Eventually, I'll put this on YouTube for some of the people that weren't able to attend tonight. But if you get to Anne Arundel County, stop by my office. It's a neat old barn turned into a really nice office. And there's the entrance to the Naval Academy Dairy Farm. It's down in uh, the Garambles area, just on the other side of Fort Meade, heading towards Annapolis. And let me stop sharing here and <clears throat> pop out. You guys, welcome through you. I'm going to stop the uh, recording at this point. <clears throat> oh, my. Just about time. I lose my voice, too. Oh, let's see, here we go. Stop recording. All right, we're going to.